Hey everybody, it is Trags, and this week on the Wild Card Edition of Red Sox Speed, I welcome Alex Barth from 98.5, the sports hub covering all things Boston for 98.5. You can follow him on Twitter, at RealAlexBarth, all one word. Again, that's R-E-A-L-A-L-E-X-B-A-R-T-H. I do that because you can never assume that nobody or somebody knows how to spell your name or what True. the exact Twitter handle is, Alex. You know that by now. Well, I still remember the first time we did a show together, the first few times I was saying Mike Petraglia, Mike Petraglia. And like you waited until the fourth show to tell me how, fourth or fifth show to tell me how to pronounce your name to the point where I thought you were kidding. You're not and alone. Yeah, well, I, I felt bad because I was pronouncing your name wrong. And now I know I, I don't need to feel bad because you're just like screwing with people. But like, <laughs> that was <laughs> my do. that was my real introduction <laughs> to tracks. That was my first mm. real introduction, I think, to track. Sometimes when I'm correcting people on my last name, and obviously I get it a lot, um, I, I pick the right occasion. Sometimes it's just not when they're introducing you or talking to you in a radio hit, you're not going to correct them on the air. You tell them later, right. if you forget to do it, you, it goes on. And that's what happened probably with you. But anyway, we got baseball to talk about a classic epic rivalry. The best rivalry in baseball renewed on Tuesday night, eight o'clock first pitch at Fenway park. The Boston Red Sox, the New York Yankees, the both of those teams finishing 92 and 70 on the 2021 full 162 game season. And by virtue of the Red Sox beating the Yankees 10 9 in the regular season series, turned out it mattered because the Red Sox will get home field advantage. I guess we'll start, Alex, uh, with okay, you. Can I throw out a stat to start yes, real quick? Please do. This is the first, do you know the last time the Red Sox and Yankees met in a winner go home game? Well, game seven of the 03. Game seven, no, 04. No, 04. 04. 04, yeah. So yep. I just thought that was fun. I just want to throw that out there. I saw the yesterday, it made me smile. So, yeah. So you know. uh, it's happened actually, uh, if I'm uh, recalling correctly, three times happened in 04, 03. Yep. Yeah. And it happened in obviously 78. And uh, obviously right. a one game playoff. This feels a lot like what uh, transpired in 1978. You're going to get a lot of Bucky Dent uh, recollections over the next 24 hours, I think, uh, oh and, and deservedly so. That game also took, a, took place at Fenway Park. But the dynamic of the sport and TV has completely changed everything. Back in the day in 1978, yes, the game was on national TV, but it was in the late afternoon, so not all eyeballs were on that particular game that day yeah i mean I, I i don't you know have a ton of memories to share about that no game. you I don't know, you weren't alive were you right I, I just know growing up i always heard bucky f and dent that's my my entire experience with that game so we'll see who that and you know with these games and we talked about this i think it was the last time that i was on there's always somebody and there's somebody who's not you know Raphael devers xander bogarts aaron judge john carlos stanton they're going to do what they do but there's going to be some guy from like the bottom of the roster that is going to etch his name in history, good or bad, in this game. We'll see who it is. Like, I don't know who gave up the home run to Bucky Dent. Like, maybe he should be more. Mike more, Torres. Uh, Mike Torres. Should he be more notorious? I don't know. But, you know, somebody's name is going to be set in, in stone after this game. Somebody's going to come up from the bottom of the roster and make something happen. I, you know, I, I, I think that there's a distinct possibility of that. Uh, I uh, definitely want to get into the uh, pitching matchup because when you take a look at this game, it's a fascinating pitching matchup because it's uh, two pitchers that know the opponent very, very well with very mixed results in one particular case. For the Red Sox, they're going with Nathan Avaldi, and he has faced the Yankees, believe it or not. You know how many times he's faced the Yankees in 2021, Alex? I want to say, is it three? Six. Six wow. times he started wow. against the Yankees. Now, I don't know which side of the fence you fall on in terms of who whose advantage that is toward, but I would say the usually the Yankees and the batters because the more you see a picture, uh, the more you know what his repertoire is. And I think in this particular case, it's going to help the Yankees. And if you take a look at uh, what he was able to do uh, in those six starts, he was two and two with a 3.71 uh, ERA. 
he uh, allowed just uh, he allowed five home runs, which is probably you know middle of the pack. His uh, WHIP was one point two, and or one point two four. Actually, pretty good for a starting pitcher. Uh, and his uh, walks and strikeouts. This is what is eye popping about Nathan Avaldi against the New York Yankees. Thirty four strikeouts, and in thirty four innings only four walks. If he has that kind of control on uh, Tuesday night at Fenway, I think the Red Sox stand a very good chance of winning this game. Here's what I would say, though, and I think you bring up a good question when you say, okay, there's a ton of familiarity here, and who who gets the advantage? I think that's the Yankees, because you mentioned of all these stats throughout the season, but sports, as we all know, is what have you done for me lately? And boy, did the Yankees look like they, they have Evaldi figured out that last time they faced him, whatever it was, two weeks ago, that series opener at Yankee Stadium, two and two thirds innings, seven hits, seven yep. runs, allowed a home run. And you mentioned the, those those strikeouts and walks, right? In that game, no strikeouts, two walks for Evaldi. Yep. So two of the four came in that one game. So yes, for the most part, you know, big picture, he's been good against the Yankees this year, but they had him squared up in that last game. They knew it was coming. They attacked him. You can't allow seven runs and two and two thirds in this game. You just can't do it. And and we don't know what the bullpen's going to be like. They do have the off day today, which helps. But Garrett Whitlock went deep into that game yesterday or, or, or Sunday, whenever you're listening to this. And they're going to need Evaldi to give him a couple innings here. So I am a little hesitant. I was hoping, all things considered, Chris Sale would be able to start this game. I thought he was the better option. Ultimately, you needed him on Sunday, and it was probably for the best, even though it didn't end up working well, out. Well, actually, as it turned out, you didn't need him on Sunday because yeah. at the worst case scenario, had they lost on Sunday, um, first of all, they would have had to go to New York for the wild card game. But secondly, um, they were at least guaranteed a play in game on Monday today. And as we record this and uh, that turned out not to be the case, sale gave them enough quality, uh, enough of a quality start that, um, you know, yes, they fell behind five to one, but they were able to rally, uh, of course, for the seven five win. Thanks in no small part to Raphael Devers, two home runs. Uh, the two run homer in the ninth uh, was the game sealer. But uh, it was just it's pretty fascinating to uh, watch how Alex Cora managed his rotation down the stretch. What he did um, with uh, Tanner Houck on Saturday in the middle of midst of a perfect game, he pulls him. Uh, I think part of that is to make sure that he has enough uh, weaponry uh, in his pitching staff uh, for the week coming up because to get into the postseason, you're going to need the arms. Yeah, again, I go back to it. I, I know, and, and you kind of said it last time that we can't count on, you know, an extended start in these kind of games. Mm, the Red Sox might have to. I know that that's not traditionally how it goes. No. I but... mean, if you're if your starting picture is getting hammered, you get them out of there. There, there's no oh, ands or buts about it. That absolutely. But I feel like don't they kind of have to give Evaldi a little bit longer of a leash than a team typically mm, would in this kind I, of? Game? I don't think they Just... do. Just because of who's behind them, you don't think so? No, uh, uh-uh. uh. I think they they feel like they've got enough uh, arms behind Nathan Avaldi that, and I think Alex Cora is confident enough uh, in this bullpen with Garrett Whitlock coming back that um, that uh, that they are going to uh, be able to uh, tap into the bullpen heavy and early if they need it. How I mean, how many innings is Whitlock going to throw? I I would hope that, and look, they were totally right for managing his pitch count this year. And he's coming back from the Tommy John and, and he's clearly a special player. You don't want to risk setting him back, but I would like to think to some extent the restraints come off here in the playoffs and that pitch count kind of takes a back seat. And I'm not saying he should come out right. and throw, you know, five innings in relief back to back to back games. But you know, what he, what he threw two or three on Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. That, that should three innings should be on the table again. Realistically, if he's feeling up for it, three innings should be on the table on Tuesday. Cause if you can get five from Evaldi, six, seven, eight, and then I, I mean, I don't know who the closer is, but I, I think you really need him to be that bridge guy. Well, I think you first of all, a lot of it's going to rely on the game situation, how comfortable and how much Alex Cora trusts 
the the particular arms in the bullpen he is about to call upon. Um, I mean, right now you've got uh, Garrett Whitlock, you've got Matt Barnes, you've got Adam Ottavino, um, you've got uh, Darwinson Hernandez, and did you say Robles? Uh, Hansel Robles. Yes, uh, I did not say him. So yes, you also have him. So and. You've got Martin Perez, who was warming up in the bullpen on Sunday to come into that game. And um, I think he did come in, didn't he? I, I mean, he, he did come in. in. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, and Nick Pavetta even pitched in relief. So, uh, and he pitched the ninth inning. So there are a lot of options that I think Alex Cora has um, in the arsenal. It'll just be very, very interesting to see how he uses them in a one game playoff. Yeah, again, it's just, you know, Whitlock's their best pitcher. I think we both agree on that. But yes. you can't, unless you throw him, you know, eight, nine or seven, eight, nine, he's not really your closer. And that's where I get scared is, you know, Matt Barnes has not had a strong second half. Ottavino at times is effective, but he's been too inconsistent for me. I know Robles has been really good for the last few weeks, but he feels like a guy who's about to implode. I mean, he's he's pitching so far above where he usually is. You gotta like, go. I'm, you I'm, gotta go with the I'm hot waiting arms, for it. Alex, I think uh, you do ultimately have to go with the hot hand, and you have to go with Robles. But I just, I want to minimize that group. The less of that group I see, the better I'm gonna feel. I want Whitlock and how, like, like for the wild card game, and then as far as they go, I want to see Whitlock and how carry this thing. Those two guys are the guys I trust more than anybody else. Last nineteen, I'm gonna leave you with this for now. In the last yep. 19 games, beginning September 8th, the Red Sox have posted a 331 ERA. In that time, they rank second in the American League and seventh in the major leagues in ERA. Sox starters, a 3.74 ERA, very respectable. The relievers, Alex, 2.79 ERA. I guess the you know the long and the short of it uh, right there is is just to say that uh, the bullpen has been getting it done and they've been getting solid starting pitching. Um, maybe that's not where we should be concerned. Where we should probably be more concerned is, is the lineup going to show up? Is, are we going to get more than Raphael Devers uh, in the one-game playoff? Because if when you're the New York Yankees, who's the one guy right now you're not going to let beat you? And the, Raphael, Raphael Devers. Devers, right? Right. Are, are we on the same page there? Yeah. Yeah, no. He's, I mean, There's he, no way he they let yesterday. him beat He's the best them. player. Yeah. I mean, he's the guy that I fear the most. And that's why uh, when I saw that, that split finger change up uh, from, I forget who it was, the, the Washington reliever, I'm like, he's going to obliterate this pitch. Next pitch, boom, he hits it 420 feet to center field for the uh, go ahead, what proved to be the um, playoff clinching home run for Raphael Devers. So uh, I don't think the Yankees are going to let uh, Raphael Devers beat him. Um, the, the X factors, and we've talked about him, uh, in the last couple of weeks, Hunter Renfro, he is somebody yeah. who I think could come up big for the Red Sox. I, you know, you talk about, and he's not exactly a bottom of the roster guy, but I don't know that he's exactly a household name either. Uh, but you talk about that guy who's going to step up and be the hero. And it's been time and time again, was it the game? I want to say Friday night that he had the big hit that kind of broke things open. Yeah. He had that home run. He went back to back with Dalbeck. Like he's been. Devers is their best player. Don't get me wrong, but I think Dalbeck has been their spark plug. He's kind of been the guy when things are slow that it's gotten things going. He had heading into this final series, an eight game hit streak. He, he went over in the final two games, but yeah, I think he's a guy, especially with Craig's and I, I haven't seen if there's an update on this. Uh, I, I don't know if, if I, I, I missed it. JD Martinez. We don't know if he's going to play or not. So it, it becomes even more impactful because you hope as much as Martin has struggled down the stretch that he could kind of revert to the guy he was and give you something because without him, it makes it that much easier to pitch around Raphael Devers. So somebody has got to step up here and protect Devers. And you think Renfro is probably the best candidate for that. Maybe Schwarber. We'll see what they end up doing with the lineup. Um, but yeah, Renfro becomes that much more important a player. Now, if, if JD Martinez can't play because it's not even like he hurt himself playing the field, tripped over second base running out there which is just the perfect thing Such to happen to the red, red sox, sox thing to have happen absolutely it, it really is can alex get back to jd martinez 
whether or not he can play, whether he may be available off the bench as an emergency pinch hitter, should the situation dictate, especially in a home game at Fenway Park, that remains to be seen. One other guy that I want to talk about who I, I think midway through the season, Red Sox fans were finally added him to the big three and, and considered him part of the one of the four most important offensive players on the Red Sox uh, is Alex Verdugo. He came through in the clutch again on Sunday, the two run double to tie the game at five apiece in the seventh inning clutch. I mean, really clutch and to be as reliable as Alex Verdugo has been to Alex Cora and the Red Sox really says something late in the season. Yeah, it, it, it was a weird season for Verdugo where he started hot, right? Remember at the beginning yep. of the year? And he had that at, – he actually, like, started, started, like, the first couple games slow. But then he had that at bat in Minnesota. He had, like, that 14 pitch. Do you remember what I'm talking about? At bat. And he ends up – it was a double or a triple to tie the game. This might as well have been five years ago. But um, that seemed to unlock something. And he went on a tear. And then he really cooled off in the middle of the season. Now he's back. I actually – Here's his splits by month. So April, he at 300. Then he goes 275, 257. He's down to 250 in July. Then back up to 341 in August. And then 314 in September and October. So, you know, that, that's a really odd path. But mm -hmm. he's back. And he was a huge reason when they ripped off those that non-game winning streak at the beginning of the year, which changed everything. I mean, he was at the center of that. And they play their best baseball when he's hot. He's clearly a guy they rally around. So to kind of see him have that game yesterday, have that clutch hit, he looks like he's in a, in a groove right now. That's big. I don't think that's something you can overlook. No, I don't either. And I think uh, it'll be very interesting uh, to see how the Red Sox come out with the starting lineup. Anything you want to see from Alex Cora uh, against Garrett Cole on Tuesday night? I mean, it, it's not what I want to see. It's just something I think is really interesting, and that's Jose Iglesias. And obviously, we're not going to see him again, right? He can't play. Right. I just think he ended up being such a good pickup. And you almost go back to the deadline. It's like, why did they just trade for this guy instead? They could have him right now. But he second base, we forget what a problem second base was before they brought Iglesias in, and he kind of settled things down. Well, now he's off the table, and that problem kind of comes back up. and whether it's Christian Arroyo, whether you're playing Kike Hernandez there, which is tougher to do with J.D. Martinez potentially out because you're short and outfielder. Uh, there was some talk of playing Bobby Dalbeck over there. I wouldn't no. touch that. No, I wouldn't go near that with a no way. Football. I wouldn't touch that with it. No way. I agree. They, they don't seem to care about defense. I think if they're willing to play Kyle Schwarber at first base, they'll play Dalbeck at second. I actually. What about putting. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I wonder if we're going to say the same thing, like talking to people in baseball. Because I, I I texted somebody. I said, is this really a thing? And and they texted me and said, well, they would rather somebody. Anyway, it almost makes more sense to play Devers at second and put Dalbic at third. So I like I don't know what they're going to do there. I actually mm -hmm. kind of agree with that because I like Devers range. The biggest issue is his with his fielding is his arm. He's erratic. But at second base, he's not throwing as far, so that's maybe okay. And again, he's got great range. At least that's something. You know what? I think in a one-game situation, I don't think that's a great idea. To, Look, to... I I wouldn't touch either one. But they've they've gotten weird at times. They probably shouldn't get weird this year. So that's why I'm not rolling anything out. I just I I it should be Christian Arroyo realistically, especially with 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 Cole on the mound. It should be Christian Arroyo. Uh, We'll see if that's what they end up doing, but I'm not ruling out them getting weird. I'm very interested so, to see how they handle it. I agree. I think it'll be Christian Arroyo at second. Could be Kyle Schwarber in left field. Um, yeah, I I think that's a possibility. I would probably go I'm trying to do this off the top of my head here. Yeah, you go Schwarber in left, Verdugo in center, Renfro in right. Mm -hmm. Who am I leaving off here? No, but you could actually no. Because you could put Hernandez in center, Arroyo at second. You put... I think they'd rather. I think they'd rather have Verdugo in center. They uh, look. You're facing Garrett Cole, and you want as many lefty bat. I mean, he's he doesn't have um, reverse splits, right? I mean, I'm just saying. Who who are you DHing? Uh, that depends on whether or not uh, JD Martinez can go. Right. I mean, that's really what it, and how bad his ankle is. And well, I'm I'm saying if JD can't go. 
you put Hernandez in center, and then Verdugo and then left, Kyle Renfro Schwarber and right, is your DH. and then Schwarber's your DH. Yeah. Right. So I I don't think he's gonna play. I just I have this gut feeling that I don't think JD Martinez is gonna play because that's what their luck has been all year. I'm not basing that off anything. I haven't heard anything, but it's I don't know. Maybe I'm a pessimist. Tracks. Maybe look at me not being a homer. Yeah, you know what? I, I I'll go. I, I'll. I'm I'm split on that, and I haven't done the numbers breakdown. I do have one number breakdown here. Okay. Alex Verdugo against the New York Yankees this year. Not great. Um, in 18 games, 71 plate appearances, 68 at bats. He has 15 hits, four doubles, one home run. He's hitting 221. He's slashing. 221, 254, 324. His OPS against the Yankees this year, 577. That ain't great. But again, you know, it's a one game playoff. You, you never know what uh, a guy like Verdugo can do in a situation like this. He's been clutched for the Red Sox late, and I think he can get it done again. So, do you want some interesting splits here on Cole? I just pulled these up. Yes, please. That's so it, we're, we're here to provide interesting, unique, insight on this red sox beat podcast alex Let, let's do it uh okay. so against righties Col- uh, righties against cole are hitting 229 this year lefties are hitting 216 but in just about 100 less at bats it's uh, if i i don't want to do the math real quick in my head because i can't but i think it's about 92 409 to 317 in 100 less at bats lefties have just five less doubles and actually have two more home runs so while the batting average is about 10, it's is 13 points below. The batting average is 13 points below for lefties against Cole. Mm. They're actually slugging almost 40 points higher. That makes sense. Against yeah. Cole. Right. That and makes granted, sense. Some of that might just be Yankee Stadium, but true. And uh, and I haven't broken down all the splits for Fenway. I just wanted to um and we'll get to it in just a moment. But Garrett Cole has some very interesting numbers at Fenway he's Park. Been, He's been overall. He's been better on the road this year than at home. Actually, we'll get. You to want his Fenway Park to... numbers? Talk for ten seconds. I'll get his Fenway Park numbers. Uh, I will tease that after we talk about the Legends brand, Alex. We need to right. service the great people at Legends Brand. Today's show is powered by the Legends Brand, an athlete-owned apparel brand that is popping up seemingly everywhere these days, including many pro locker rooms and on some of today's top athletes. Legends is owned in part by athletes like Steve Nash, Matt Barnes, Baker Mayfield, and even NFL legend and local hero, Willie McGinnis. Also, Celtic, former Celtic, Marcus Morris Sr., among many others. Legends makes high-performance apparel with a style and comfort you'll want to wear all day. Visit legends.com today and see why athletes everywhere are swapping out their big box brands for Legends Apparel. Use the code SOX20, that's S-O-X-2-0, and save 20% on your first order. Again, that's legends.com, promo code SOX20. The offer ends October 10th. Back with Alex Barth of 98.5, the Sports Hub. Here are the numbers on Garrett Cole at Fenway Park this year. One and two, 619 ERA. He has allowed five home runs at Fenway this year, and he has a 1.63 whip. Those are not good. No, and I think that's got to be really encouraging. That's got to be really encouraging if you're the Red Sox. And if you go back, I, he's, he made one start in each year, 17, 18, and 19. That first start, he allowed five runs in five innings. That next start, two and six. The 2019 start, he was actually good. He, he, he allowed no runs through five innings, but he did allow six hits. So – not his favorite ballpark to pitch in. No. And in, you know, pitching so mental, right? And I think when you know you have no margin for error like this in this one game playoff, that's the kind of thing that can sneak into somebody's head. And I don't, I, I, I look, I haven't watched every start Garrett Cole's ever made, but I've watched him in some big games when I watch him. He's a very good pitcher. Right. But he does one of the best. He, he, he does seem like a guy that, if, if things start going wrong, it could snowball for him mentally. He doesn't seem like the most mentally tough, you know, he doesn't have that killer instinct that you sometimes see from aces. So if that, if Fenway's in his head and the Red Sox get to him early, they could potentially make it a long day for him or a short day, depending on how you look at it. 
Yeah, I mean, I just think it's pretty fascinating that Aaron Boone decided to go with Garrett Cole. But I mean, again, in all fairness to these managers, they had to make some decision based on um, the next couple of days uh, without knowing how Sunday was going to unfold, right? I mean, they had to have their best picture ready in a one-game playoff. And whether or not he's done well at Fenway Park, you ask Aaron Boone, that's probably immaterial at this point. We just expect our best players to rise to the top, and uh, that's what they're going to expect out of Garrett Cole. And I think when you look at the Yankees pitching staff too, I mean, yeah, he hasn't been great at Fenway Park, but who else are you going to trust, right? Most of their guys have an ERA around four, four and a half. Who are you going to go to in that game, even with the splits at Fenway Park, do you feel better about? I I still think he's their best option, all things considered. Like, I, I don't mean to come out and say, oh, they're idiots for for pitching him, but it is something you have to consider. Um, If you're the Yankees and you're up by one run, you're going to tell me you're going to trust a role as Chapman, right? I mean, they have no other choice. That is their closer. I understand that. But as somebody who followed the Cincinnati Reds for a long, long time, and was very fascinated in watching game seven of the 2016 World Series, in which the Cubs had that two run lead against the Cleveland Indians. And Aroldis Chapman gives up the two run homer uh, down the left field line tie game. And he winds up taking a vulture win in game seven. Um, I, I just, I have a feeling this game's going to come down to Aroldis Chapman one way or another. And if I'm a Yankee fan, I'm pretty nervous about that. Yeah, I was going to say, let this come down to Chapman. For me as a Red Sox fan, I'm, I'm all in that on that. I remember, what was the game? One of the games over the weekend, it was Friday, and they were down one. But it was, you know, it was a game they needed, and it was almost a situation where you throw your closer there, and they got Chapman up, and then they sat him down. Like, they had him up. He was warming up, and they didn't put him in the game. And I, I don't think they trust him. I don't know how they can trust him. Look, when he's on, he's on. I actually think, when he has his stuff, he might be the best closer in baseball. He's filthy, but it's just consistency is such a big part of that job, and he doesn't have it. I'll tell you this, who I really like, and I, I'm probably going to butcher this name, Jonathan, what is it, Luizaga? Uh, you know who I'm talking about? I do. Um, give me a I, second. My Yankee fan friends call him lasagna, but. Oh, that, yeah, I, Luizaga. Know, Luizaga. Yes. I was watching him, so he came into that game when they sat Chapman down and he's throwing like one Oh five with junk, that guy should be the closer. That's who I'm afraid of. That's control he comes in the game. But the yeah, reason I, he's not is control. And he wasn't throwing one Oh five. No, he hit like one Oh three on one of the, the, the pitches. I is control a big issue. I mean, I'm looking at his numbers now, 69 strikeouts, 16 walks. Hmm. Usually somebody that throws that hard naturally is going to have control issues because the ball is not going to go straight. Usually. Yeah. I mean, Chapman doesn't really have control either. Well, now, think... now, now Chapman's actually been better this year with his control. He's taken some off the fastball. He's not throwing like 101 every single pitch like he used to. And he's throwing his slider more. And I have always believed, and there are scouts who believe that he should have been a starting pitcher. I don't, we can go that far, but his slider, if he gets it over the plate, it's almost unhittable because then it dips right out of the uh, strike zone. So uh, he's somebody to keep an eye on. Uh, with how he attacks the batters. Yeah, I, I just, he's, it, it's just that inconsistency for me. Like, he doesn't have that. You, like, we, we started talking about this. That, that game's not over if he's on the mound. It can be a three-run game. Game's not over if he's on the mound. I, I don't know that I feel that way about other relief, other closers in the league. Like, I, you know, some of these better closers, you get them on the mound, game's over. If, if Chapman's in the game, the Red Sox have a chance. If the Red Sox are fortunate enough to play well enough to win this game on Tuesday night, they have the Tampa Bay Rays. Do you think the Red Sox have enough knowledge and can put it all together to beat Tampa four times in seven games? Wouldn't it be, it'd be three and five, right? I'm sorry. Three and five. Yes. Yeah. Well, even better. Um, Well, that actually, and honestly, that makes a difference because it, you know, they're, they're so top heavy in the rotation. The Red Sox are with Evaldi, who I guess probably won't pitch, but sale and in those games matter more. 
Yeah, I think so. It's a divisional opponent. The Red Sox handled them pretty well at the beginning of the season. I know they struggled here down the stretch, but this is a team that, that I said at the beginning of the year, I was on with Matt McCarthy on the, the Hardcore Baseball Podcast on 98.5, and you, you just got that vibe. This is a snowball team. Whatever's happening with them, it's going to happen to the extreme. You know, mm. they're either going to get super high or super low. Well, that be proved to be exactly swings. right. And, and I think if they beat the Yankees, now that, that good mojo, that good juju, that good momentum, you know, that's snowballing. And again, the Razor team they beat early in the season is a team they know, like, as frustrating as the Red Sox were in the second half of the season. And people who listen to the show, I was on here yelling, ranting, raving, as frustrating as they were. The AL kind of sucks. I don't know that any of these teams are a breakaway candidate. Like, I know the Rays looked good, but they outplayed their roster much like the Red Sox did, especially after they uh, they lost, what's his name? Their, their best starting pitcher, Glasnow. So, you know, I don't think they're this dominant force. I really like the White Sox, but that's a young team in the postseason for the first time. You know, they, they're rough around the edges. They were there uh, last year. Were they there? Okay, but they're yes. still, like, young. They're still new. They are. Houston, Houston, they are what they are. They're kind of on the back end of their run. They're certainly beatable. And then the Red Sox, you know, the Red Sox are a team that when they get hot, they, they're they're as good as anybody. And the Yankees are a team that is, you know, pretty much wire to wire played under what they're supposed to be. They're an underachieving team. It's a wide open race to me. It really is. And then, I mean, when you get to the NL, I think the Giants and the Dodgers, those two teams are their own beasts. And I wouldn't put them in that category. But if you get to that point, I mean, you get to that World Series, it's any, but, you know, anything can happen in the World Series. So, I, I like the Red Sox chances as much as anybody in the field. I really do if they win this game because they'll have that momentum behind them. They have the playoff experience. This is still, in some sense, you kind of have that same core you did in 2018 in Martinez, in Bogarts, in Sale, in, in, in Barnes, who maybe wasn't part of that core, but he was there. Christian Vasquez, right? So And Cora, obviously Alex Cora. So, yeah, if they win this game, I, I I think they have a good chance to beat the Rays. I really do. And I would I would give them a good ch- shot against either Houston or, or Chicago, too. So uh, setting up the postseason picture for Major League Baseball, the Red Sox and the Yankees kick it all off on Tuesday night uh, in the American League wildcard game at Fenway Park, 8 o'clock, Wednesday night, 8 o'clock on TNT. Uh, it is uh, the L.A. Dodgers and St. Louis Cardinals in the wildcard playoff. And uh, the winner of that series will face the San Francisco Giants. If it's the Dodgers and Giants for a best of five series, uh, baseball is living a charmed yeah, let's life. Go. Uh, Braves and the Brewers. Uh, Braves, the three seed against the Brewers, number two seed. I like the Brewers to get to the World Series, actually. Um, and then uh, that those two teams, uh, those two brackets would meet off in the uh, National League Championship Series. The series that I think is going to get overlooked is one you just alluded to, the White Sox and the Astros. Astros uh, finishing yeah. as the two seed in the American League, the White Sox, the three seed. Uh, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see who advances from that and goes to the American League Championship Series. But uh, all eyes will be on Fenway Park on Tuesday night as the Red Sox and Yankees square off. The game is on ESPN nationally. And uh, it's pretty much a made for ESPN game, don't you think? Yeah. So wait, before we wrap this up, can I ask mm-hmm. you a question? Yeah. I have this argument every year with my friends. Sure. Did the Red Sox, if the Red Sox lose, did they make the playoffs? Does making the wild card oh. game count as making the playoffs? Okay. Technically, yes. In my mind, no. Thank you. Yes. There you go. Like if the Mariners had made it and lost, that playoff drought continues. Like this is... It's like the play technically. In the no, it doesn't. Uh, and because I had this debate with, with fans of the reds uh, about really 2013 when they got just boat raced by the pirates in that one game playoff, Johnny Cueto fell off the mound, all of that garbage. Oh, that was a great game. Um, but you know, that is included as part of Cincinnati's postseason record. And I just think it's silly that a one game playoff like that, I think it's a one game playoff is what it is. Exactly. It's, it's not, it's not the post-season. A, a postseason series, but exactly. I would agree. I think you're spot on. And well, I try to be Alex. Hey, I, I just want to confirm here that, um, because I don't want to give people the wrong information. The game on the national league game, the wild card game between the Dodgers and Cardinals 
that is, I either say said TNT or TBS. Is it TBS? I I think it's it's normally TBS. Oh, I, 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 I can look here. I got it. I think I do. Well, let's see. This is thrilling podcast talk. This is great. This is awesome. Um, um hello. Uh, what are we doing here? It's normally TBS because it's normally Orsillo. Yeah, so it's TBS, right? I think so, yeah. Not TNT. There's the schedule. Yeah. No, TNT's NBA. Yeah, correct. Yeah, TBS. Yep. I'm there we right go. Now. TBS, Dodgers and Cardinals for all those Dodgers and Cardinals fans tuning into this podcast, the Red Sox Beat podcast. There you are. So that's um, eight o'clock. Um, on Wednesday night out at Dodger Stadium. But we will have a complete recap coming up uh, of the Red Sox and Yankees one game wild card playoff. The, as Alex said at the top of this podcast, it will be the fourth time ever these two teams have played a winner take all. They played a game seven in the 04 ALCS, a game seven, of course, the legendary one in 03. And the one game playoff, which was not a part of the postseason. That was a part of the regular season in 1978. Right. Um, and of course, that is the game forever etched in uh, baseball lore as Bucky Effing Dent. We'll see if Bucky we have Effing another Dent. one of those moments coming up this week and coming up Tuesday night at Fenway Park. I want to thank everybody for downloading today's podcast. Thank our great guest, Alex Barth. He is one of the great young reporters covering Boston sports for 98.5, the sports hub. Please do follow him on Twitter. He is an epic follow at real Alex Barth. I'm Mike Petralia and for Alex Barth, this has been the Red Sox beat podcast powered by CLNS media.